It's March the 23rd, 2020. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen... This is Alex Salmond, Scotland's former First Minister. He's standing outside the High Court in Edinburgh. Uh, I said I had great faith in the, the court system of Scotland. That faith has been much reinforced today. Salmond has just been acquitted of 13 counts of sexual assault against nine women. Dozens of journalists jostle for the best spot as he speaks. As many of you will know, there are certain evidence that I would have liked to have seen led in this trial, but for a variety of reasons we were not able to do so. At some point, that information, that facts and that evidence will see the light of day. Everyone there understands what he means. He means this isn't over, not by a long shot. Salmon believes he was set up by the Scottish Government in the civil service, and he is determined to prove it. I had been covering the story since August 2018, when claims Salmond had behaved in a sexually inappropriate manner were first published in a Scottish tabloid. The fallout had destroyed his relationship with his former protégé Nicola Sturgeon and cleaved a divide through the nationalist movement in Scotland. These comments outside the High Court felt like a ramping up of hostilities. All great dramas have a central theme, and this one is about power. It runs through unfolding events like an electric current. The desire for it, what you do with it when you acquire it, and what happens when you refuse to let it go. For the last 20 years, Salmond and Sturgeon have been the SNP's towering figures. Their relationship has been symbiotic, each to some degree responsible for the ascendancy of the other. But now they're pitted against each other, and what began as a story about alleged sexual harassment has become a bitter power struggle between the two and a fight to the death for the direction of the party. To understand the struggle over the soul of the SNP, you have to go back to the beginning. The peculiar nature of the SNP as a political party is incredibly interesting. Libby Brooks is Scotland correspondent to The Guardian. Like me, she attended much of the Salmon trial and has interviewed Nicola Sturgeon on numerous occasions. It is like a, a family. We're talking about people who have, certainly the centre and the upper echelons of, of the party, have known each other for decades and whose bonds have really been formed in unpopular opposition. Independence was not riding high in the polls when these people started their political trajectories. Within institutional memory, they can remember getting laughed at in the street, having to put their own money into paying for campaign materials. So there is a, a particular closeness. And the SNP is often criticised for being... Um, almost sort of too disciplined. But I guess you have to recognise the fact that that discipline has got them to a pretty powerful position in Scottish politics and indeed UK politics. When Salmond and later Sturgeon joined the nationalist movement decades before, the SNP was a very different beast to today's slick electoral machine. Kenny Farquharson is a columnist at The Times in Scotland. In the early 90s, the SNP was a substantial organisation within Scottish politics, no doubt, but it was still something of a fringe and something of a, of a hairy fringe as well. It had rather Ken Speckle characters and wasn't really known for its professionalism, but, you know, Salmon changed that. Salmon wanted to move the SNP from the margins to centre stage, which meant convincing some of the party's more ardent supporters, who were impatient for independence, to bide their time. This was quite a battle between the fundamentalists, for whom it was independence or nothing, and the gradualists who saw the possibility of devolution as a stepping stone to independence. And Salmon fought that battle, fought it hard, and he won it. So from that point on, he begins to recruit people like Nicola Sturgeon and John Swinney, other sort of moderates, to the aim of creating a professional party. Alex Bell was a special advisor to Salmond from 1999. He left the job a few years later, but was wooed back when he was appointed head of policy. In Salmond's trial, he was called as a defence witness. I was always a sceptical advisor in the two times that I'd worked with Alex Salmond. Our relationship was always uh, tetchy at best, but I think he liked having a few people around him who would challenge him and at least attempt to intellectually defeat him, even if sometimes we abjectly failed. Andy Collier worked as a speechwriter for both Salmond and later Sturgeon. I first met Nicola Sturgeon during the 1992 
general election campaign. I was working as political editor of The Sun in Scotland at that time, and Nicola Sturgeon came in to the Sun office in Glasgow to talk to me, to do an interview. She was 21 at the time, as I recall, and she was the youngest candidate for any party in Scotland standing for Glasgow Shettleton, which ultimately she did not, of course, go on to win. Uh, But anyway, I remember her coming into the office. I invited her in. It was a good story, a good feature for us, youngest candidate. She struck me immediately as somebody who had great presence. She was really rather shy and very, very serious and worthy. Seemed very young, but very strong personality, well-considered answers. And it was pretty obvious, even at that stage, that the only way she was going to go in the SNP and in Scottish politics was up. Alex Salmon saw in her someone who was capable on the media, could give a clear and concise message, and was prepared to be loyal to the broader cause, which was the professionalising of the party, rather than disloyal and engaged in the divisions of the old party. So she very soon became a key ally to Salmond. And also, you do have to remember that the SNP's vote in the late 1980s and early 1990s was heavily weighed towards middle-aged men. And what Nicola obviously provided was the fact that she was a young woman. The relationship between Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond has been very, very close. And and really, it is at the heart of that SNP family. Nicola Sturgeon always describes Alex Salmond, or previously has always described Alex Salmond as, as her great friend and mentor. He refers to them as having this unstoppable partnership. And that is a real privilege for me, seriously, to be here today supporting Alec. He has done so much to support me every day of my political career, so it's great to be here supporting him today. Are we going to work hard for Nicola? Yes! Yes! I don't think they heard us down in Glasgow. And it is quite extraordinary the way that that relationship has now fractured. I remember really vividly interviewing Sturgeon the day that the news came out about Salmon's arrest in in January 2019 and I recall the distress and I guess pain etched on her face that morning. Nicola Sturgeon has, has said that the pair of them have not spoken now since July 2018 and in fact in a recent interview she was talking about him being one of the biggest presences in her life outside of her family and her husband. The loss of that was something that she has had to grieve. Close though they were, there had been fallouts along the way. In 2004, the role of party leader was once again up for grabs. Salmon said he had no intention of standing this time, so Sturgeon threw her hat in the ring. She was annoyed when he changed his mind, but then he suggested they should run in a joint ticket as leader and deputy. They joined forces and Sturgeon became his anointed successor. So from that point on, the two are entwined. Their political fortunes are inseparable and they form a very good team. Nicola could perhaps become frustrated with Alex, very bombastic kind of, you know, let's just get it done and I'm going to take the chair and I'm going to throw it through the window kind of attitude, the way that he tended to work, which in many ways was one of his strengths. And I, I suspect at times it was perhaps a little wearying. Nicola being Alex's deputy is a little bit like somebody having to be Napoleon's deputy. You know, it's not necessarily the easiest job in the world to do. I think we can begin to see the relationship unravelling during the referendum campaign. In 2012, Alex Salmond makes Nicola Sturge and the minister responsible for the referendum, which means she starts to get into the detail of the argument. And I think rapidly comes to the conclusion that much of what Salmond has been asserting doesn't stand up to the facts. If I could suggest to you that there is one illustrative evening It is the evening of the first television debate in 2014 between Alex Salmond and the leader of the No campaign, Alastair Darling. For more than half of my life, Scotland has been governed by parties that we didn't elect at Westminster. This is a televised debate 
and it has what TV producers call a spin room. That is to say, affiliates of either campaign in a room which also has cameras in it who are there to sort of give immediate reaction and, and their facial expressions are used to tell the story of the evening. During the run-up to the referendum, Nicola Sturgeon had begun to see that Alex Salmon's assertions about Scotland's wealth and indeed his assertions about how it would move on economically were kind of coming apart. That came to a head that night of the first debate in which Nicola Sturgeon can be seen to be almost wincing as Alex Dammon stumbles over some of the economic detail. ...capital of a country and its currency, but you can't tell us what currency we'll have. What's oh, an idiot you're going to make of that? Alistair. The Scottish electorate rejected independence by 55 to 45%. And Alex Salmon stepped down as First Minister. I think the party, parliament and country would benefit from new leadership. Uh, therefore, I've told the National Secretary of the Scottish National Party that I shall not accept nomination. Yes, it lost by 10 points, so the SNP might have been expected to slink off and lick its wounds. Instead, something surprising happened. Those energised by the campaign just kept on going. Sturgeon grew in stature and popularity so quickly that by November 2014, she had embarked on a rock star style tour, greeting saltire waving fans up and down the country. So all of a sudden, SNP membership starts to shoot through the roof. She's suddenly in control of a party much richer, more powerful and more popular than it had ever been under Alex Salmond. And Alex Salmond is now not in the position of power that he has been used to for the last 25 years. Does he resent her success and her popularity and the strength that's suddenly behind the party and he's, and he's no longer in a position to relish it? He resents Nicola Sturgeon's success. He feels in part it's really his success which she's inherited. Then other people in the party began to think the same. Weirdly, it tended to be that kind of traditional group of nationalists who took a very straightforward view of independence, that it was we win independence and then whatever happens, happens. Whereas Nicola's view of independence is we have to shape the nation and we have to manage the after effects of independence, which could be just as big a task as winning independence in the first place. He begins to resent her when she begins to shift away from his view of independence. Now, Samad, in some senses, then sees, well, hell's bells, if that's what's happening... I am then going to appeal to the kind of die-hard quarter of the SNP movement, the middle-aged white man who just wants independence for independence' sake. And I'm going to recast myself as a kind of Bonnie Prince Charlie figure, the sort of king over the water whose rightful crown has been taken from him. So he has then become a free agent, if you like, and over the next couple of years gets back into Westminster in the 2015 general election, but also develops a habit of extemporising about SNP strategy, which greatly irritates Nicola Sturgeon and the then headquarters staff. And so there began to be a souring of the relationship, such that at one point he had to be approached by one of Nicola Sturgeon's advisers and told, stop it. After all that time leading the SNP, could Alex Salmond have found it difficult letting go? He had come within a hair's breadth of being the leader of an independent Scotland. Through sheer force of character, he had moved the party from a punchline to a political force. Salmond, bluff and bombastic, had always behaved like an insurgent leading a coup. But Sturgeon, a lawyer by trade and serious by nature, had a different approach. She wanted to convert soft no's to yes by demonstrating good, efficient, devolved government. These differences in approach created friction, particularly during the 2017 general election campaign, which Salmond considered lacklustre. Then, after losing his seat, he did something that shocked some of his closest allies. He launched a chat show with Kremlin-backed Russia Today, or RT as it's now known. David Leask is an investigative journalist and linguist who has worked in both Scotland and Russia. Well, I think my reaction was probably quite similar to that of Nicola Sturgeon, who was upset, we understand by this, and quite similar to that of one of the then SNP MEPs, Alan Smith, who gave an on-the-record quote using the F word, which I think is the first time I ever encountered that happening. A lot of people were very concerned about Alex Salmon taking a job on 
on RT. I imagine the politicians are upset by how that looked. But actually, my interest in this goes back to when he started giving interviews to the channel, which were, was before the independence referendum. And I actually did something unusual for a reporter. I actually went to, and when I was speaking to Alex Salmon's PR people suggested they should look into what RT was. Uh, he continued to broadcast with them for some years after. And of course, he now effectively works for them. Salmond has consistently defended the decision, claiming no external party has tried to influence the content of the show, but that didn't stop the criticism. Well, I think it provided his political foes with obvious ammunition. This is a man who is, you know, was the leader of one of the big democratic centre-left pro-independence movements in Europe. And here he was taking money from a regime which, for example, outlaws people calling for the independence of their own nations and regions in Russia to such an extent that you can be imprisoned for that. Salmon's dalliance with RT is not the only way in which the tentacles of this story have reached out beyond Scotland to become entangled with wider global events and movements. That same year, 2017, a worldwide conversation around sexual harassment, power and consent was sparked by allegations against Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. After the story broke, the ripples spread out to Westminster and then Holyrood. Sturgeon pledged there would be zero tolerance of such behaviour and encouraged anyone with a complaint to come forward. Within the month, Mark MacDonald had been forced to resign as Minister for Childcare after sending inappropriate texts to women. In the wake of this scandal, the Scottish Government brought in a new code of practice. The new code allowed complaints to be brought not only against current ministers, but former ministers, dating right back to the inception of the Scottish Parliament in 1999. Two women alleged that Alex Salmond had acted inappropriately towards them during his time as First Minister. It was around October 2017 that everything with Weinstein was in the news and things were coming out in Westminster as well and if I'm honest, I just couldn't really get away from it. This is one of the complainants, a former Scottish government official, but this is not her voice. You know, it's a very unusual position in the sense that you're often the only person that's travelling with a minister. You might be together 24 hours a day, whether or not that's in a hotel or in the back of a car or in an office. It's extremely long hours, Often there's alcohol involved. Often, you know, there are close relationships forged. Often there are very difficult relationships. Essentially, everyone's there to do a job. And I think there's real potential for the blurring of boundaries and normality. I think it's really important there's a shared sense between people who work in these positions of what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate behaviour. And that people are in some way protected. Eventually, Salmond would be charged with 14 offences against 10 women, though one didn't appear in court, and that charge was dropped. The offences were alleged to have been committed between 2008 and 2014. Salmond denied them all. I've made many mistakes, political mistakes, personal mistakes, I know that. But I am not guilty of harassing anyone, and I absolutely deny any suggestion of criminality. For my party, this will be extremely upsetting to members of the SNP up and down the country. It's a difficult situation, but what is important is that complaints are treated seriously regardless of who the person complained about is. I have been very clear about my belief in the importance of that, and that's a principle that cannot be applied selectively, no matter how difficult that might be for me, for my party, or for others. Salmond was acquitted of all charges in an 11-day trial. I wish on my life the former First Minister had been a better man. That was the refrain repeated by both prosecution and defence. Salmond's advocate, Gordon Jackson, produced witnesses who challenged some of the complainant's evidence. He suggested his client may have behaved inappropriately, but never criminally. The jury agreed. And I'd like to thank all of the people who've sent so many messages uh, over the last... Uh, 18 months or so, but particularly uh, in, in recent days. Uh, Here we are then, back with Alex Salmond at the end of his trial, standing outside the High Court in Edinburgh. As many of you know, there are certain evidence that I would have liked to have seen led. And that evidence he says he wanted to see led? He's talking about emails and WhatsApp messages he claims will reveal an orchestrated attempt to prevent him from returning to frontline politics. 
Salmon believes the code of practice introduced by Sturgeon's government to deal with the complaints was extended backwards deliberately to catch him out. Kenny Farquharson of The Times. There are two competing versions of events after the Salmon trial. One is that Me Too, as a political global movement, comes along and it's an extraordinary phenomenon right across the world. It changes climate for all big organisations everywhere and the Scottish government is no exception. And the Scottish government reviews how it handles the complaints of sexual harassment and so new rules come in and women come forward emboldened by the Me Too movement to tell their stories and as a consequence Alex Salmond is snared by these changes and accused of sexual misconduct. That's one version. But there's another version And the agent of change in this other version isn't Me Too. It's dark, sinister forces within the SNP establishment who see Alex Salmond as a political threat to Nicola Sturgeon's leadership and engineer a change to the Scottish Government rules on sexual harassment. It was Kenny McCaskill, the former Justice Minister and an old ally of Salmond, who first used that phrase, dark, sinister forces. And many party activists believed him. Libby Brooks again. Certainly in advance of the trial, speaking to older activists, I found that a lot of them shared Salmon's real sense of betrayal about this code of conduct that the Scottish government had introduced and the fact that it applied retrospectively to, to former ministers. And I think it's worth pointing out that a number of those older activists that I spoke to were women who were very much of a mindset that certainly in the time that they were active in politics, sexual harassment did go on. Men did make inappropriate comments and gestures, but it was something that they had had to thole, that they had had to put up with. And there was almost a sense of irritation about the Me Too movement, about younger women saying, well, now we need to call this kind of behaviour out. I mean, obviously, I'm not talking about significant acts of sexual violence, but perhaps lower level inappropriate behaviour that that these women felt that they had had to put up with during their careers. But then speaking to younger SNP activists in advance of the trial, I think what became really clear to me was the way that a lot of ground had already shifted. You've got tens of thousands, really, of, of new SNP members who joined after the first independence referendum just as Alex Salmond was standing down as First Minister, whose whose most kind of formative experience of a leader was that strongly feminist leadership of Nicola Sturgeon. And, you know, a number of them said to me, and it felt quite brutal at the time, they would describe Alex Salmond as being a historical figure. One of them said to me that he was yesterday's man. Now, it's impossible to overestimate Alex Salmond's impact on the Scottish independence movement, But by the same token, we're talking about these sort of younger activists for whom feminism, a focus on equality, is is really key to the new country, the new Scotland that they are wanting to create. There is no doubt that the handling of the original complaints was botched. Shortly before he was charged by the police, Salmond won a judicial review against the Scottish Government on the grounds that its inquiry was procedurally unfair and tainted with apparent bias. The Government conceded it had breached its own guidelines by appointing an investigating officer with prior involvement in the case. It was ordered to pay more than £500,000 for Salmond's legal expenses. Salmond is steadfast in his belief that he was deliberately set up. But how would such a conspiracy work? And would a man whose influence was already on the wane warrant such a plot? I wanted to find out more. Salmon's advisers and political allies were reluctant to speak on the record, so I asked an old journalist colleague of mine, the columnist Kevin McKenna, who is close to some of Salmon's supporters, if he could shed some light. Those who have supported him, and amongst his most vociferous, are Kenny McCaskill, uh, various people at Westminster, They haven't used the word conspiracy in public, but there is a clear inference that they feel there was something darker near the root of this, and they feel that the decision of the jury to acquit him 
on all charges is indicative of the jury themselves feeling that there was something not quite right or something questionable about how these charges were brought and that this will be proven by the production of certain emails. So the conspiracy theory is predicated on the idea that the women colluded with one another. Is that right? There's a belief by some in the party that there was an element of conspiracy. But, again, they're privy to information that I haven't seen. But that's the theory. Well, it's a, it's, it's a theory. It's one of several theories. Uh-huh. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily indicate on their behalf that all of the women or even a significant number of the women who made the complaints were involved in these machinations. So there is a second part to this alleged conspiracy then, that senior figures in the Scottish Government and the SNP put pressure on women to come forward, both to discredit Salmond and to shore up their own position in light of the failed judicial review. Nicola Sturgeon has described it all as nonsense. Right now, the claims and counterclaims are being interrogated in a parliamentary inquiry. But an online war has been raging since the end of Salmon's trial. In the hiatus caused by the coronavirus pandemic, the schism between the camps has widened, with Salmon's more extreme supporters attacking anyone they perceive as an enemy. David Leask. So a lot of the people you're talking about are people who've been radicalised in this zealous, angry cesspit of social media politics and who for many, many years would have carried a cloak of a salt iron, would have always been you know, really zealously defensive about the SNP, but while simultaneously often undermining some of the core values of what is a democratic movement. Now, a lot of these bloggers and social media activists have sided with Alex Salmond following both his decision to work for RT and his um, legal problems. And some of them have become extremely aggressive in doing that. And I think you've probably yourself experienced some of the the backlash from, from some of that social media fervour. In the weeks after the trial, I'd written a long read for the new media platform Tortoise, which was the result of months of work. It was well received by many, but it also led to me becoming more personally caught up in the story than I could have imagined. From the day of its publication, I started receiving hundreds of abusive messages a day on Twitter. I blocked, I muted, but still they came. As a journalist, I am used to abuse, but the false accusations that I committed contempt of court and was funded by a conservative PR firm to write a hatchet job were in another league. You know, as an observer of online discourse, what do you think is going on? What are they trying to achieve? Well, they're trying to smear you, Danny. They're trying to to make you out to be essentially somebody who's committing a criminal offence who ought to be imprisoned, and that's tremendously serious. I mean, if you were to talk about another country, if you were to say there was a country in Europe where it was routine for, uh, you know, bloggers with huge followings associated with major politicians to call for journalists to be imprisoned, I think we'd regard that as quite a serious thing. But that has happened with you and with other journalists who are being accused of of contempt of court. In some ways, it's easy not to take them seriously. But of course, this kind of abuse and these kind of smears can make life quite dangerous for journalists. It is not an altogether untrivial matter, in my opinion. My experience has been alarming, yet that's nothing compared to what the women who made the allegations against Salmond have had to deal with, the names they've been called. A witch? Part of a coven, a cabal, a harpy, a whore, a liar. It's just, words can't really describe it. And do you ever feel that you and the other complainants are being used in a broader political game, even beyond Me Too, you know, involving, say, the two camps that are supposed to have, to have developed within the SNP? That certainly is what it feels like. There are three fault lines in the SNP just now, and I would characterise them as personal, political and cultural. And the personal one is over the Salmon trial and the accusation that he was basically set up by Sturgeon supporters in in an attempt to destroy him as a political threat. So the split is, do you back Salmon or do you back Sturgeon? The political one is over independence and the push for a new referendum. And the split is between those who think 
Nicola Sturgeon has been far too cautious and those who give her the benefit of the doubt and think she's just being sensible and realistic. And the third split is, is part of the culture war we're seeing just, not just in Scotland, but right across the world between populists and progressives. And, and in the SNP at the moment, the touchstone issue for this is transgender rights, which has been enormously contentious. So you have, you have splits that are personal, political and cultural and the bad news for the SNP is that all these align. The people who think Salmon was framed are the same people who think Sturgeon has been dragging her feet on independence. And they're the same people who think feminism has gone too far and we are ruled by out-of-touch elites. And, you know, it's the perfect storm, really. It's the ideal conditions for a civil war within Scottish nationalism. Sturgeon began her leadership in a position of strength, but her administration is not without its critics. And while Salmond has been sidelined, he continues to be revered as the politician who brought the country closer to independence than ever before. The extent of this support was demonstrated by the crowdfunder to cover the cost of the judicial review, which he set up days after the allegations became public. Thousands donated using the hashtag IStandWithSalmond. Kevin McKenna first started hearing of the pushback against the Sturgeon government in 2017 when he visited some SNP MPs in Westminster. I'd been speaking to a few MPs and it became clear that, well, the ones that I was speaking to anyway were beginning to express a kind of level of discontent with the leadership. You know, of course, there's been... The two major issues which are when or when not to have a second referendum and with that, you know, how how intensely do you go for that? There's the kind of granular level, there's dissatisfaction with the kind of the emergence of a managerial class within the SNP, advisors, connections with certain lobbyists, the press office. And these are all, you know, highly paid career opportunities there's a perception that if you're one of these advisors if you're a of this managerial class in the SNP you, you you can build up quite a big pension this has become a very lucrative career the SNP controlling devolved government and there's a perception and admittedly you know <laughs> nobody in the SNP is going to say no we don't want another referendum we, or we don't want independence but there is a perception that some people have grown very comfortable. In response to these criticisms of the Sturgeon government, the SNP deputy leader, Keith Brown, said in a statement, Doing right by the people of Scotland is the key to our success. The SNP will never lose focus and will always work hard to retain the support and trust we've earned. Indeed, what those critical of Sturgeon and her gradual approach could not have foreseen was the impact the pandemic would have on her standing because right now she's riding high in the polls. Libby Brooks. I'm just back from a trip to the northeast of Scotland where I was trailing around after Boris Johnson on his first trip to Scotland since the pandemic, in fact, since last December's general election, and perhaps understandably refused to answer questions about why Nicola Sturgeon's approval rating is currently three times that enjoyed by the Prime Minister. Sturgeon has, has been an extraordinarily effective communicator throughout the pandemic. And you can see the results of this, not just in her own approval ratings, but also in support for independence, which has tipped into a sustained majority for yes for the first time in history, which is, you know, extraordinary, really. She herself has said latterly that, that perhaps there is a lesson in this for independence campaigning in, in the sense that support for it has gone up significantly and in a sustained way whilst they were getting on with a day job. But an increase in support for independence has made some within the movement impatient. They have begun to ask what the SNP will do if Boris Johnson continues to refuse permission for a second referendum. There is much talk of a plan B, which would mean holding a referendum without the UK government's approval, similar to what happened in Spain with Catalonia. 
Alternative pro-independence parties have begun to form in response to Sturgeon's perceived lack of urgency. So far, these pose little threat. But what if Salmond, who is no longer an SNP member, could be persuaded to lead one? Would he, could he, ever come back? Salmond's former head of policy, Alex Bell. Yeah. <laughs> um, never imagine that the bumps and scrapes which Alex Salmond has been through in the last five years are enough to deter him from coming back or enough to deter a significant group of voters in Scotland from wanting him back. And now there is the parliamentary inquiry. Even if allegations of a conspiracy turn out to be unfounded, Nicola Sturgeon will be asked difficult questions about what she knew about the Alex Salmond allegations and when. It's a very real danger for Nicola Sturgeon because it's going to focus not on Alex Salmond's behaviour but on her handling of his behaviour. I suspect that if the coronavirus crisis hadn't come along, we might be in the last few months of Nicola Sturgeon's first ministership. The questions that she has to face in the parliamentary inquiry are serious and far-reaching, and they question whether she broke the ministerial code. And if she did break the ministerial code, then that's a resignation issue. Others are confident Sturgeon will survive into next year's Scottish election. The mainstream vote, for now, at least, is behind her. Over the next few months, we will find out more about the way in which the Scottish Government handled the allegations against Salmond. But whatever comes out of the parliamentary inquiry, whatever scalps are or are not claimed, relationships between the two camps are unlikely to be mended any time soon. There's the paradox then. Just as it appears support for independence has become the majority position in Scotland, the party and the movement is as bitterly divided as it has ever been.